We have major breaking news out of the United States Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit in Virginia and Maryland dealing with Maryland Shall Issues Challenge to the Handgun Qualification License. This is a big deal, this case we're going to talk about, because not only does it pit various views of how you deal with shall issue permitting regimes, it also deals with what I consider to be a possible horse race between two judges that one day could become nominees to the United States Supreme Court by President Trump. Let's talk all about it when we get back. Hey folks, I'm Mark Smith, host of the Four Boxes Diner, proud American gun owner, constitutional attorney, member of the United States Supreme Court Bar, and author of the brand new best-selling book, Israel Disarmed, What the 10-7 Attacks by Hamas on Israel Teach Americans About the Right to Bear Arms. We must always learn from history. We must always learn from the mistakes of others. And learning from the history of the Jews and the history of Israel and how they dealt with privately owned firearms and self-defense and the like is a very important lesson for we here in the United States to make sure we don't make the mistakes they've made over the years. And we don't forget what I argue the Jews in Israel forgot between 1948 and today, which is you cannot rely upon your government to protect you. You must take it upon yourself with private arms and a self-defense gun culture. I talk all about that in Israel Disarmed. All right, folks. So, Maryland Shall Issue, great organization down there in uh, my old state of Maryland, uh, PG County. Shout out to the athletes I used to play a ball with. Uh, big case here involving Firearms Policy Coalition, Gun Owners of America, uh, and others, many others, challenged the handgun qualification license down there in Maryland. I'm not going to get into all the details uh, beyond saying that in order to get a handgun and concealed carry, there's a whole process that had to go through that you have to go through. And this was a challenge, a facial challenge to those various laws, uh, the background checks, the testing requirements, and so on and so on. Again, for our purposes today, I'm not going to get into those details because they don't matter. Because what really matters here is when you're in front of the United States Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit, it's a crappy anti-gun court. Simply put, there are some very good judges on the Fourth Circuit, but overall, when they're doing anything on banc, and this Maryland Shout issue case dealing with the handgun qualification license is indeed on banc, which means that you had all the judges of the Fourth Circuit here in this case. When that happens, you can kiss your Second Amendment rights goodbye. It's just the way it is in the Fourth Circuit. Terrible anti-gun court. You just got to recognize this. Uh, you know, that's the reality on the ground. Uh, so with that said, the majority of the en banc court did exactly what you would expect them to do. Uh, they screwed it up six ways to Sunday and screwed up the Bruin methodology. We'll get to that in one second. And of course, they found that all these various shall issue licensing regimes, these qualification rules, the training requirements, uh, the time it takes, the background checks, and so on and so on, all are essentially perfectly fine under the Second Amendment. Now, I should note that this challenge was a facial challenge, a facial challenge, which means that the only way the plaintiffs could really win is to show that the law was unconstitutional under the Second Amendment in all its applications. They clearly left open the Fourth Circuit, the possibility of as-applied challenges to be brought by individuals who can argue that with respect to their situation, these laws down there in the state of Maryland are unconstitutional. Now, we knew we were going to lose in the Fourth Circuit because it's a terrible anti-gun court. There is no way to win in the Fourth Circuit when it involves the Second Amendment when you're dealing with an en banc court. If you're dealing with a panel uh, of ju three judges, it is possible to get a good panel that will follow the Constitution, follow the Bill of Rights, and follow the Second Amendment, but en banc, forget about it. So with that said, what did the majority of the court say? They essentially said that footnote number nine, footnote number nine, in the NYSERPA versus Bruin case in 2022 by the U.S. Supreme Court was really dispositive. If you may recall, footnote number nine in NYSERPA versus Bruin talked about how basically saying, look, this case of Bruin is dealing with a May issue, a May issue um, permitting regime that gives tremendous discretion to New York law enforcement, New York licensing officials to decide whether you're good enough to be able to exercise your right to keep and bear arms outside the home to be able to conceal carry. 
And the Supreme Court in Bruin says that discretion was absolutely unconstitutional under the Second Amendment. No can do. However, in footnote 9, what they said was that the decision of Bruin itself should not be taken to cast dispersions upon or attacks on or rule on whether or not shall issue licensing regimes are constitutional or not. Now, they basically said, impliedly, that if a shall issue regime, which says that if you apply, meet objective, narrow criteria, you automatically get your license to carry, uh, they kind of indicated that that would be okay without really deciding it. Now, what the majority court here in the Fourth Circuit said is that footnote alone, for all intents and purposes, governs the law of the land. That they basically argued, in a sense, that footnote number nine, when it comes to shall issue permitting regimes and whether or not it's constitutional, is dispositive, which means a lower court or an inferior court, as defined by Article Three of the U.S. Constitution, need only read footnote number nine of Bruin and simply apply it to uphold any type of licensing regime on a facial basis, leaving the door open for as-applied challenges to if a regime is too expensive financially, takes too much time, or is abusive in some other way. So that's what they said. Now, we knew that that was going to happen the majority. But where the action is that I want to talk about is the horse race to the United States Supreme Court. We all know that there's a reasonably good chance that President Trump could be president again. That would be extremely good for the Second Amendment movement. Uh, and that is what, in my view, is would be great for the Second Amendment. And hopefully that happens because former years of Kamala Harris and Joe Biden and Merrick Garland attacking our Second Amendment rights with the possibility of them swapping out some Supreme Court justices or packing the court will not be good for the Bill of Rights or the Second Amendment. But again, that can, we can talk about that in other videos down the road. The real fight, kind of interestingly, is a horse race between two judges on the Fourth Circuit, both of whom I would say are serious contenders to sit on the United States Supreme Court if President Trump is elected. The first is Allison Rushing, uh, Allison Rushing, who concurred with the decision in this case and tried to essentially explain that while she thought you still had to go through the text first burden shifting to the government to justify a modern day gun control law using historical analogies, finding a historical tradition of firearms regulation, she said that footnote number nine of Bruin was not controlling, but that it was indicative of where the Supreme Court's head was at. And she did the analysis and said, at the end of the day, uh, you still have to do the Bruin analysis of the how and the why. And she said, based upon the gestalt of information there, including what the Supreme Court had signaled in footnote number nine, and the fact that she's a lower court judge, she said she would uphold the law, but would have done the analysis. She basically concurred in the judgment of the majority, but disagreed with the rationale there. So frankly, um, in many respects, Judge Rushing, Allison Rushing, did a good job following what may very well be what the Supreme Court intended. So at one level, she did her job as an inferior court judge to try to guess what the Supreme Court was thinking to try to get to the outcome that she thinks the Supreme Court uh, would desire or would have found in this case. So at one level, uh, that is not a crazy approach. However, there's another serious, serious, and I'm going to star this right here, folks, a serious, serious contender to sit on the U.S. Supreme Court, and I've been watching him very carefully for quite some time, and he is definitely on the Mark Smith shortlist to sit on the United States Supreme Court if President Trump is elected. We will break that down in a separate video of the people that I think we should keep an eye on and who we should cheer for and who we should definitely cheer against. That will be for a separate video. So listen to this name here. Judge Julius Richardson. Judge Julius Richardson. Now, Judge Richardson is definitely on the super short list of a potential Supreme Court pick by President Trump, and we in the Second Amendment community would applaud that decision. There's some other very great judges out there involving our Second Amendment rights, but I have to say that Judge Julius Richardson has to be very much top, very close to the top of the list when it comes to what we'd like to see on the U.S. Supreme Court uh, should Donald Trump as president have an opportunity to nominate somebody for a vacancy. Specifically, in addition to the fact that he dissented in this case of Maryland shall issue, stating that he thought that the shall issue permitting regime in the form of the, of, of the handgun qualification license there in Maryland was unconstitutional and unenforceable under the Second Amendment. So he dissented, dissented, from the majority opinion and took them head on and says that footnote number nine is simply there to tell 
uh, lower courts that they should not treat Bruin as dispositive on the shall issue permitting regime and to make it clear that Bruin did not deal with shall issue. They're just saying that all the Bruin footnote number nine was about was just saying we're deciding may issue permitting regimes. We're not commenting on shall issue. So don't take that as some sort of a criticism of shall issue permitting regimes, but you still have to do the work because you have to understand that footnote number nine arises in the context of the methodology of interpreting the Second Amendment of you got to read the text, figure out whether or not the conduct by the plaintiff is covered, and then if it is, the burden shifts to the government to come forth with a historical tradition of some sort of firearms regulation that's analogous to what they're trying to uphold by looking at the why the regulation was enacted in the 18th century versus why it was enacted today, and the how it's enforced in the 18th century versus how it's enforced today, and try to figure out if there's a sufficient analogous connection there to justify the modern-day gun control law. Now, Judge Julius Richardson has been on the right side of several Second Amendment cases and we need to look at him very carefully. To begin with, Judge Julius Richardson not only dissented from this terrible anti-gun decision, which is a little bit more defensible in certain respects than some of the other anti-gun decisions out of the Fourth Circuit. I will give the Fourth Circuit majority that because they had the benefit of the footnote number nine that they could kind of hang their legal hat on. Nevertheless, Judge Richardson attacks this to say that uh, this is not appropriate because you look at the text of and this is why I like it. You look at the text of the Second Amendment, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. A restriction or delay or hindrance on the ability to acquire, here what I just said, acquire a firearm, acquire a handgun, is obviously an infringement at a textual level because you're making it hard, either by time or otherwise, or you're providing some sort of an obstacle or restriction, a hindrance, a limitation, if you will, on the ability to acquire a handgun, which obviously is a restriction at some level on your ability to keep, which means to have, or to bear, which means to carry, a handgun. So Judge Richardson said that because that conduct of possessing and carrying a handgun is implicated by the statute of Maryland here, the text is satisfied and the burden then shifts to the state of Maryland to Governor Wes Moore and his buddies to justify the law using 18th century historical analogs. And then Judge Richardson goes on to say there's simply no analogous law dealing with permitting regimes in the 18th century that could conceivably justify this modern day restriction on these background checks, on these restrictions, on these licensing issues, and said therefore it's unconstitutional when you do the Bruin, the Bruin methodology, the Heller Bruin methodology of text first burden shifting and then historical tradition analysis of firearms regulation. So Judge Richardson has really stood out in this opinion, but this is not the only time Judge Julius Richardson has stood out in favor of the Second Amendment. He has also, remember, wrote a very powerful, perfectly phrased, in my view, dissent in the Bianchi case. That's right, Judge Richardson dissented and got the in common use test absolutely correctly. He got it absolutely right in the Bianchi case. So again, another feather in his cap. The other thing, of course, is that in the Hirschfield case, you may have, forget, you may have forgotten about this because it got vacated. In the Hirschfield case, he also nailed it right to say that restrictions on 18, 19, and 20 year olds being uh, able, uh, you know, preventing them from being able to fully exercise their Second Amendment rights also violate the Second Amendment. So you have three powerful decisions in favor of the Second Amendment on 18 to 20 year old cases, on quote unquote assault weapon case of Bianchi, and now on the Maryland shall issue, shall issue permanent regime case, three, three major decisions in favor of the Second Amendment by Judge Julius Richardson. So if you look at his credentials, he also is a former law clerk to Judge Richard Posner and to the late uh, Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, William Rehnquist, and uh, former prosecutor, uh, very high-end credentials, very high-end uh, qualifications uh, for a lawyer, and obviously is making a name for himself on the United States Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit. So when you compare the horse race between Julius Richardson on the one hand and Judge Allison Russian, uh, Rushing on the other hand, uh, I would say this is a close call. Both would be very good, but I would say that this is an opportunity for Judge Allison Rushing to step up and to have uh, you know done something a little bit more powerful on the Second Amendment than she did. So I would say in this battle today, uh, Judge Richardson definitely took the lead over Judge Rushing for the next Supreme Court slot. Of course, there's many other 
very good judges that we're going to talk about. They basically David Strauss out of the Eighth Circuit, Lawrence Van Dyke, and others out of there's several in the Ninth Circuit, and of course there's a whole list of them in the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals and other courts as well. But again, we will get into those details in a separate video about who we should be looking for for uh, future Supreme Court nominations. But again, for the purposes of today, the key to understand what happened here is that footnote number nine of Bruin, which was really designed to sort of send a signal, in my view, to the lower courts that we really don't want to be dealing with shall we issue permanent regimes right now. We got other Second Amendment cases. So for the moment, you know, don't litigate those over the top. But bear in mind that if you come across a, a shall we issue permanent regime that is abusive in some way, come on back to us and sue. And I actually think a lot of these shall we issue permanent regimes, including the one in Maryland uh, and the hang on qualification, I think they're all very much subject and at risk for a um, for an as applied challenges. And I think we can ultimately clean that up over time. But there's a lot of other Second Amendment issues I think the Supreme Court's going to get to do, deal with first. I think they're going to want to deal with assault weapon bans. I think they're going to want to deal with 18 to 20 year olds. Uh, I think they want to deal with sensitive places. I think these are the things they're going to want to deal with kind of first. And I think that they will get the licensing. And I'm also working on some very uh, interesting licensing scholarship, uh, which we will talk about in the next several months uh, as time passes. But in the meantime, we had a loss in Maryland shall issue. Uh, nine not an unexpected loss because, again, the Forest Circuit is just a terrible anti-gun court when they get together on bonk, and that's what they do. They get together on bonk and throw the Second Amendment in the trash heap of history. But the game is not over, my friends. The war is not over. The fight for our rights is not over, and we're making strides all across this great country. The President Trump becomes the president and has the ability to continue to shape the federal judiciary with his judges. Well, let's just say... We'll see what happens in the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals um, and what the Supreme Court does because they have jurisdiction over all these courts, including the anti-gun First Circuit out of Boston, the anti-gun Ninth Circuit out of California, and the anti-gun Fourth Circuit out of Maryland and Virginia. All right, folks, hope you learned a little bit something here today. I'll put a link to the opinion down below in the description. Make sure you follow me at X at Four Boxes Downer, and don't forget to subscribe and hit the like button, and we will see you again very soon, I hope, here at the Four Boxes Diner. Order is up. Table 2A.